facility. Lecture of the 2008-2009 season uh, began seven months ago with Peter Eisenman, and it ends here, and it ends now, and it ends for good with Michael Spears. I'm sure there's some significance to the trajectory that we started with Peter Eisenman and with Michael, but others can draw their own conclusions about that. I'd like to thank the Brown Foundation uh, for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, as they did the Michael Hayes lecture and the Jose Uri lecture last semester. Uh, particularly thanks Sarah Herta, who can't be here uh, tonight, directly to the for her support of the school, uh, and also for the larger cause of architectural discussion in the city. So thank you to Sarah and Mike for their multiple co-sponsorships. Uh, as you know, last year Michael became the uh, dean uh, at the University of Kentucky, uh, College of uh, Design in Lexington, and so I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce a fellow administrator uh, to UIC, as unlikely as that is. Uh, someone earlier remarked that Michael and I are two real administrators, but Stephen Colbert and John Stewart are two real news anchors. <laughs> Actually, I always thought that we were more like the runners-up in the who looks more like the Verizon guy. But regardless, we're happy to have him here tonight uh, and expect him as now a Midwesterner to join us uh, back, uh, back here often. Michael has a BA from the University of Mississippi, a PhD from Duke University, and before assuming the deanship at Kentucky, he was the graduate program director at SciArc, where he co founded the postgraduate program Metropolitan Design and Research, MRD. In addition to his tenure years at SciArc, Michael has also taught at UCLA, the University of Michigan, Delft, the Bear Log, Columbia, Harvard, uh, Yale, and on and on. Michael was the senior editor of any magazine in his writing architecture book series, was a member of the editorial boards of Wiener Hall and A Plus U, and is currently a contributing editor for Architectural Record. Among his many awards and honors, the one that I am most envious of, is that he was recently named a colonel by the Kentucky State Legislature. Uh, quite an accomplishment. He has not uh, started to collect racing horses, but he is a Kentucky colonel. Uh, Michael is among a tiny group uh, of contemporary design theorists, critics, and educators who have had a profound effect on the way in which architecture and urbanism are discussed internationally. Ten years ago, uh, as many of you know, Michael was the curator of the Big Soft Orange exhibition that brought, in, brought a new generation of Dutch offices, such as Crimson and L NL Architects and others, to the attention of those of us in the U.S. for the first time. In his role then as director of the MRD program at SciArc, he introduced models of scenario planning to designers, as well as now, what you could say, is the 10-year legacy of the research studio model. Michael's real genius, however, is always adapting to, or maybe appropriating, uh, his new context, as he did when he arrived in LA by appropriating that generation of designers in the same way that he did, had done with the Dutch uh, generation of designers during his stint in the Netherlands. So rather, in other words, we focus on the obvious formal differences between the Dutch datascape and the American digital school, he reframed both under his concept of design intelligence in a series of columns he did for A plus U, and began to understand both scenario planning, let's say the Dutch model, as well as rapid prototyping, let's say the American digital model, under the part of the same general project of versioning or making alternative futures possible and visible. Uh, so again, rather than taking part in a stylistic debate, uh, Michael, I think, more wisely appropriated all the evidence in the contemporary field for his own purposes. Uh, so there's lessons to be learned now. At the same time as he promoted a series of younger designers, he was also taking on, or maybe I should say taking out, uh, older versions of critical theory, as with his historic arguments in print and person, with the likes of Hal Foster, Reinhold Martin, and Felicity Scott, among others of that persuasion. Uh, in fact, one of them, I think, referred to Michael as a CIA operative. Who is hissing from the audience? Um, I can say uh, that Michael and I don't always agree on what we share, our enthusiasms. Hawaii 5 -oh, yes, Nandi and Alonzo, no. Uh, but uh, we invariably say, share the same dislikes. Uh, and in the end, maybe common dislikes are more a sign of solidarity than common likes. 
Still, at the end of the day, and in keeping with his model of small truths to design intelligence, Michael is someone most interested in projecting a positive program. In his new role as dean, Michael has already taken steps to leverage his position as governor of Kentucky, as well as the mayor of Lexington, uh, to advance uh, unlikely architects into the public uh, sector. Uh, and we look forward to seeing the material uh, evidence of that new form of expanded curation in the near future with projects that get realized uh, in Lexington and in Kentucky. Uh, so please join me in welcoming the Kentucky Colonel, uh, the Stephen Colbert of Deans, Michael Speaks. That's fantastic. And thank you, Bob. I, I, I truly, you don't know how much I really appreciate that. Um, I'm actually originally from Mississippi, uh, so the big Kentucky Colonel is not um, Okay, uh, I, I forgot, I guess I didn't get wired so I can't move around a bit, which I'd like, I'd like to do if I can, but I'll, I'll, I'll try this. Um, it's terrific to be here. I don't think I've ever, a number of people think I've liked it here before, but I, I don't think that I have. Um, but I'm really uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, I have a lot of friends in Chicago, I got to see a bunch of them, it's, uh, it's been nice to be here a couple of days. Um, I want to talk about uh, the lecture is design thinking. It's a topic that has um, found its way in a lot of journals and websites and um, particularly business magazines the last maybe seven or eight years. And to such an extent that some people think the discussion is over with. Um, it's an interesting discussion to me because uh, design thinking, I think, is something that's, uh, it's a really, I think it's really important for schools. I think it's really important to practice. Um, and oddly enough, the only places where we're not teaching design thinking is in design schools. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, about what it is, why it is, and how it connects with some of the other things I've written and lectured about the last couple of years, namely this idea of design intelligence and, and all that. Um, well, we, we've, uh, we're all, I guess, uh, familiar with this. this. We, we watched uh, the Olympics over the summer and got excited about these great new buildings and there was lots of discussion about them. Also lots of critiques, particularly of this building, uh, for political and other reasons. Um, <coughs> other things we could say about this kind of project, I mean, uh, those first uh, are all from uh, China, this is Eric Lomas, it's a project in Culver City. Um, this is for you, um, Fernando Diaz Alonso. Uh, now, I, I put these up because all of these kinds of projects are now identified with part of the excess of the last, say, 10 years. Um, and a lot of people are, are taking the occasion of a downturn in the economy to, to, to criticize um, those excesses, the star architectures, uh, the star architects, uh, the, the obsession with product design, except the, the obsession with obsession. Um, the, the, particularly with the last couple of slides, with, with Renan's work and with Eric's work. Um, even people like Philippe Stark believe that we have an opportunity now to, to do better things for the world, um, designing for uncertain times. This is a, from the, the most recent issue of the Um there, there have been a number of criticisms um, leveled in the last couple of weeks, uh, particularly at these architects of excess. One of the default positions I think that's emerging in that critique um, is expressed in this Metropolis Press book, Design is Activism. There's a kind of a default position um, where I think a lot of people, and, and this is another book that maybe expresses it even more uh, poignantly, uh, Architecture for Humanity, uh, Cameron Sinclair's website and book. You all are probably aware of the, of the book and the website. Um, even Nikolai Rusov, uh, the fabulous architecture critic from, um, from New York, uh, has gotten religion on this idea. Having promoted star architects and made a career of that for the last, let's say, 10 or 15, yeah, 7 or 8, 9, 10 years, he now is upset with them because they're not interested in sustainability and 
um, and the kinds of things that he thinks we need to begin to think about with the challenges that this economy brings. Um, this is a piece of his from, it's from two, three weeks ago. There are people who are even upset that he's upset. Um, Aaron Sinclair from Architecture of Humanity wrote this piece on his uh, blog and website complaining that the Rousseau's uh, criticism is, is misplaced and that he's actually even more moral than Rousseau. That's a higher um, And then this piece of, uh, kind of emerged in the last, say, two weeks on the Huffington Post blog, which you may follow. It's an interesting discussion and debate that's emerged there. Um, again, uh, Cameron Sinclair uh, here is, uh, was very pleased to report that he was to debate the, uh, in his view, uh, excessive uh, Zaha Hadid in London, and she didn't show up, and therefore he won. Um, and it's a report about that. It was a piece that followed that. Uh, by Francis Anderson from uh, KCRW in LA does a show called Design DNA, Design and Architecture. And she basically says this is not a debate. It's not a debate between people who are really turning to more humane uses of design and architecture, like architecture humanity, and the excessive people. We could have both. In fact, we could have a lot of things. This is not a mutually exclusive discussion. I tend to agree with her. However, I mean, all, of these, all of these critiques are interesting and relevant um, that is the critique of excess, high design, and the kind of object-oriented or assessed architecture that we witnessed in the 1990s. Um, we, we, we all now see daily these kinds of uh, things on web blogs, um, and they're real, and they're poignant, and they're quite powerful when we see these images. Um, Let's just say, I, I've been interested in a critique of those same people that, and the same problems that are, are being now articulated in those articles that I showed before, namely Cameron Sinclair's and, and Rousseau's. It's just that I didn't support those people for seven or eight years of their career by doing so. In fact, one of the things that, I, that I've tried to point out in a number of articles, and having done so, I've been identified with a number of extremely unsavory people, including Bob Sommel, um, is, that, is that there's something bigger at stake, uh, let's say, in the contemporary discussions about excess and objects uh, and, the, and the problems with all that, than simply the design of the object at the end of the day. It's not just the blogging. There's something else going on. In this piece, what I try to point out is that, uh, is that what we suffer right now is a lack of a credible uh, intellectual paradigm that defines design practice and what's happening in design schools and education. This piece was really an attempt to try to call attention to that. Um, it was as a result of this piece and a couple of others that George Baird, you probably know, created this discussion about criticality versus post-criticality. I never felt like I was really part of that discussion. Um, but still, this was all connected to that. Um, there's another way, I think, to get at or to criticize those architects, uh, and it's not, not because of what they did, it's not because of the objects themselves, it's because there's another way that we can think of, um, let's say, uh, the, the relationship between thought and action in architecture. And some of this, some of this is manifest in this discussion around this idea of design thinking, so we'll talk a little bit about that. This is a piece by Tim Brown. Uh, he's at IDEO. He probably knows the innovation firm in San Francisco. Um, this is a piece he wrote in Harvard Business Review. The interesting thing about design thinking is that almost everybody is interested in it, or has been, and knows what it is, except for us, um, design culture. This is a, um, a little an image uh, of Roger Martin, who's the dean of the Rotten School of Design in Toronto, um, probably one of the more progressive and interesting business schools, certainly in North America and maybe in the world, they now use design in their MBA curriculum. So for them, design is so important that it's part of the MBA curriculum itself. And in fact, Martin is hiring, uh, has been hiring a lot of designers to teach in the MBA program, including people like Richard Florida, who we may or may not like, but still, they got him in a business school. Um, it's not just business schools who 
know and understand what design thinking is and, uh, and, and have been using it as part of their curriculum. Engineering schools, like the D School uh, at Stanford, uh, which was started by uh, the, the people who founded IDEO. But even the US military uh, is interested in design thinking. This is a, these are two incredibly interesting articles. This one and this one just published this last month by a, kind of a military trade journal. Uh, this is Al Troy, who's an assistant professor at the Advanced Military uh, Studies uh, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Basically, they're using, they, they're employing design thinking as a way to train um, combat uh, ready officers uh, to think, uh, uh, let's say, um, in a very creative, innovative, but also real time uh, way uh, where robust solutions are demanded, and if they're not given, then people die. Um, the thing that's most disturbing uh, to the people uh, that Bob alluded to earlier, a lot of the so, so called critical critics, is that their list, the list of references that these people use, are the, would be the same as rival market. So they cite the same people, interestingly enough. Uh, Michel Foucault, Jean Deleuze, Pierre Bourdieu, all are very well known by these people. It's an interesting problem. In any case, um, what is design thinking? Well, I, I, for people who know me, you know I can't resist these kinds of charts. Um, this is an attempt to, to try to, 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 to give some historical context, uh, and I've been apologies to those who've seen these charts, some of these charts before. Um, it's an attempt to try to give some context to what I, to, to let's say, the, 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 the issue of what a new intellectual paradigm would be. The, the basic argument is this, um, and, and this is essentially an attempt to try to create a structure, and this is not a definitive argument. This is, this is a way to get a discussion going. The argument is basically, um, since, say, whenever we think modernity began, whether it's with the Greeks, whether it's with the Renaissance, whether it's with the, with the Enlightenment, to say, from the beginning of modernity to the 1960s, and then something else happens during the post-modernity, the 60s to the 1990s, and then I want to say something else has happened at the end of the 90s that's just begun and that we're in the middle of and we're not sure exactly what it is, and I'm just calling it super-modernity for lack of a better term. Um, but I'm going to run through these very, very quickly, and I don't want to take up much of your time, but uh, let's say 18th century to the 1960s, modernization uh, took the form of internationalization, nation-state was the principal actor, uh, the, its, its interest was in providing security against risk for its citizens. Um, and I, I want to talk more about the bottom part. From the 1960s to the 1990s, the form of uh, modernization was multinationalization. Multinational corporations were the principal actors. They were to provide security against risk for the multinationals and not for all the people. Um, from the 1990s to the present, let's say the form of uh, modernization is globalization. Uh, the market state is the principal actor, and the market state is very different than the nation state or a multinational corporation. The market state is a nation state that's operating like a company, operating like a, like a corporation. And its interest is no longer in providing security, but only providing opportunity for innovation. It's a very new and interesting and ominous set of possibilities. What I want to say is that there are intellectual or, yeah, there's an intellectual paradigm equivalent to each of these historical periods. The industrial period from modernity, where goods are produced, the, the intellectual dominant is, is philosophy. And what philosophy's ambition is to do is to discover the truth, it's looking for an essence, and wherever it finds falsity, below it it will find some, some kind of form of truth. It's a very standard kind of modernism. What happens in the, from the 60s to the 1990s is that this form of enlightenment truth is called into question and radically undermined. Post-industrial services are the principal goods, and the intellectual paradigm, I want to say, is theory. And in this paradigm, um, what, what happens is a new true emerges. It's a true that is discovered when all of the things that the enlightenment needed to repress is underpressed. And typically, that's the... It, to, what, what that amount amounts to is a search for simulacra. Oddly enough, in the, in, in the distinction between true, true and true and false, false is always favored, because the false undermines any idea that there is an essential truth of the kind of the enlightenment mind. 
what, what's really argued and interested, or what, what, what this paradigm is really interested in, and Heidegger is the real figure for this, undermining any idea that there is any essential truth at all, and yet at the same time going back to some primordial truth that got, or, that got organized by modernism before, that, 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 that preceded the organization of truth by the Enlightenment. So, for example, in Heidegger's case, going back to the Presocratics. Um, so the argument here is, this is this is a form of truth that was created by modern by modernity, and that there's something more true than that. This is the typical intellectual form of this would be dirty and deconstruction, or Deleuzean critiques of anything uh, that that makes true claims and his use, for example, of simulacra to do so. So this is a this this intellectual paradigm principally is interested in critiquing any idea of authentic truth. I'm sorry, this is not a philosophical lecture, really, but. I'll be in a second. Um, so, uh, from 1990 to the present, uh, let's say we go from industrial, post industrial to informational, good services to knowledge, and what we've got, we go from philosophy theory to what I want to call design thinking, and I'll get to that in a minute. Philosophy uh, is interested in true, theory is interested in uncovering and repressible of truth, and design thinking is only interested in transforming chatter into intelligence, tr transforming reams of knowledge into plausible truths that one can use to do something with. Um, interested in little truths. Okay, let me, let me try to ex talk a little bit about what I mean by intelligence. And I hope by doing so, I can explain a little better why this is important. Because this will have, I want to argue that this has real implications for architecture, for architectural practice, for design practice. Um, both in schools and in real world practice. Um, intelligence, what do I mean by intelligence? This is a book published about five or six years ago uh, by a guy named Jeff Hawkins. He was the inventor of the um, Palm Pilot software and the object itself. Hawkins made a lot of money with the, with, the, with the invention. And he had the idea that the next set of in innovations that he wanted to sort of develop would be only possible if he could understand how the brain worked, because he needed to understand how the brain worked to, to, to develop what he called truly intelligent machines. So he went back to Berkeley, did a PhD in, in neurobiology, and he wrote this book as a, as a, as a result of that. It's kind of his thesis. Um, he's an interesting idea of intelligence. For him, intelligence is not the storage of tons of information. It's not being smart. It's a very different idea of knowledge. And his, this idea of knowledge accords with this third model that I talked about. What, what he says is intelligence is this. Your brain stores, stores patterns as memories. And what you do when you, uh, what the brain does is it's, it's essentially a prediction storage device. The brain makes predictions or it speculates about things in the world. It takes those patterns that it stores, speculates about things in the world. The information that it finds in the world that does not accord with those patterns gets re-registered as new information and new patterns get produced. Now, so he says, intelligence is measured by the capacity to remember and predict the patterns in the world, including language, mathematics, physical properties of objects, and social situations. Your brain receives patterns from the outside world, stores in its memories, and makes predictions by combining what it has seen before with what is happening now. Prediction is not just one of those things the brain does. It's the primary function of the neocortex and the foundation of intelligence. What do you, what, what, what's, what's startling and exciting and new and different about this is that knowledge is not something that's fixed. Knowledge in this view looks up intelligence is different than knowledge here or here. Because in both these paradigms, knowledge pre-exists and you have to discover it. Knowledge here is an essential form of knowledge. Knowledge here is a repressed form of knowledge that modernism in order to do what it does, which is, I'm sorry. What's different about intelligence, uh, as, as Jeff Hawkins is talking about, is that knowledge is produced, but it's also constantly updated. It's constantly evolving, constantly changing. It's a very different model of knowledge. It's very similar to what this guy, Michael Schrave, uh, uh, talked about, uh, say, five or six years ago in a book on, uh, on prototypes. 
Spring was arguing that prototypes are historically understood as the, as the innovation itself. What he wants to say is that, that prototypes are means of producing, producing innovation. And he, he talks about that by, by, by referring to this book piece that Stephen Levy wrote called Spreadsheet Way of Knowledge. Spreadsheet Web Knowledge is very much like this model of intelligence. I promise this will have some architectural connection at the end of the day, so don't, so don't, so don't, don't worry too much, I hope. Um, uh, spreadsheet Web Knowledge, is, this is what he means by it. In 1971, the first digital uh, uh, spreadsheet was invented, VisiCal. And what it allowed uh, companies to do, I have a company, you have a company. If tomorrow I want to buy your company, before the invention of the digital spreadsheet, we have to sit down with 10 or 15 accountants and value the companies, but if it's an oil company and tomorrow the price of crude goes up, then the values that we've generated don't make any sense. But then we don't, we can't properly evaluate the companies. With the digital spreadsheet, those values can constantly be updated, but not only can they be updated, but I can speculate about the value of your company by saying, if these are the parameters, if this and this and this, this is what it, this is what it would be worth. Now, this speculation, this spreadsheet speculation, given that these are the constraints, is a form of knowledge that's neither true nor false. It might be true. It's a what if. If this and this and this were the case, if the price of oil were this, and you had 10,000 employees and you had this much capital and the lot, this is what it would be worth. But instead, if the price of crude was this and this, this is what it would be worth. But the point simply is, like this model of knowledge that Hawkins was talking about, is that knowledge is not fixed. It's, it's produced, and it's neither true nor false. It's possible. It could be true. Now, um, since Bob mentioned Stephen Colbert, I couldn't have predicted that he would. Um, I'll show you another example, which comes from a little book that undoubtedly you've all read. Um, a little book written by a moral philosopher at Princeton University called On Bullshit. It's a very interesting book because it also raises a similar idea about knowledge and truth and what I would really call intelligence. Frankfurt wrote the book about four years ago and it became the New York Times bestseller. The, ex the interesting thing about the book is that Frankfurt draws a distinction between what he calls the, the liar and the bullshitter. The liar, like the truth teller, knows what the truth is, but with each lie, the liar covers over the truth. The bullshitter has no interest in the truth whatsoever. The bullshitter only has an agenda. Yeah? So the bullshitter doesn't know, has no interest in the truth whatsoever. They simply tell you what you want to hear to get you to buy into whatever they're doing. The liar has a lot more work to do, but the bullshitter is incredibly inventive. And you'll see, I hope, the connection between this model of intelligence that Hawkins is talking about and the spreadsheet we have now. But you'll only be able to do so if I let uh, Professor Frankfurt speak himself, which I'll do now. Well, let's stop and go back. Our right, sound is not working. Oh, you're going to have to bear with that hum for just a second. Because it'll, it'll be worth it, I promise you. This is a retired professor of philosophy, moral philosophy, for instance, being asked by a younger colleague a very intriguing question. What is your theory of bullshit? What is bullshit? Well, it consists of a, a lack of concern for the difference between truth and falsity. The motivation of bullshit is not to say things that are true or even to say things that are false, but serving some other purpose. And the question of whether what he says is true or false is really irrelevant to his pursuit of that ambition. Bullshit is not necessarily a liar. What he says may very well be true. And he may. Uh, not think that it's false. I, I was careful to try to uh, make a distinction between, make, make clear the difference, in, as I understand, between bullshitters and liars. Now, the liar knows what the truth is and has to cover over the truth with each lie. The bullshitter has no interest in that whatsoever, speculating. Um, now, it's just such a, <laughs> such a good slide I couldn't do something. What's interesting about it is Larry Leeford is one of the founders of the D School at Stanford University, where design thinking has become the, 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 the sort of the basis of their curriculum. And uh, he, Leeford wrote a little review of this, and, and he said, you know, I was in the bookshop one day with my daughter, and I saw this book, and I thought, my God, how can I pick this up? He picked it up, he read it real quick, and he said, you know, there's something really intriguing about this bullshitter guy, this character bullshitter, because 
Because the bull share is amazingly inventive, and in fact, we designers really could use some of this bullshit stuff. Because, because if you think about it like this, in a BS session, in a bullshit session, what happens? People sit around and they step out of their normal, say the normal constraints that they would be operating under to speculate. What if this? What if that? What if this? What if that? And, 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 and so Liebert started to use this idea as part of some of his classes he was teaching. I would say that there's a real problem with the bs -er. And the problem is the, is, the, is the problem that Frankfurt identifies. And that is that the bs -er has an agenda. Um, the liar and the truth teller know the truth but cover it over. The bs -er has an agenda who doesn't have any interest in the truth but tries to use that non-interest to lead you into his agenda or her agenda. And there's another character that I think is much more compelling and useful for designers, and that character is the intelligencer, who has no agenda, who has no interest in true or false, but only in the speculative idea or model of truth production, very similar to the one, again, that Hawkins talks about in the intelligence model, and very similar to this idea of um, uh, spreadsheet web knowledge. Let me try to this is the last of these, I promise. It has bearing on, on design and architecture. It has to do with something like this. Modernism, postmodernism, supermodernism. Modernism was interested in ideals, in absolute universal truths, going back to the Greeks at least, um, where, where right action is guided by thought. Yeah? Um, truth guides action. And that typically took the form of the modernist manifesto. Um, and that was those were generated as blueprints by Utopian Vanguard. They're out in front, they know everything, they have the idea, they generate the blueprints for the future, and it's simply for those things to be made later on and produced. So thought guides action. Something different but similar happens in this postmodern period. Where, 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 where I'm going to argue the ideology, where I'm going to argue the uh, intellectual agenda, here is one of ideals. In the postmodern period, it's one of ideology. Thinking still guides doing, but it does so in the form of critiques, which reveal new truths. Um, so here it's universal truth guide action. Here, critique reveals new truths that then become the ideologies for the for, the, for a vanguard that we all know too well in the 1990s. And they, and they include postmodernism, both the Forty Gacy, Charles Jenks version, deconstructivism of all in all its varieties, you know, from the from the from the from the, from the Austria to New York. Folding in architecture, when they, you know, when Greg and Jeff ran out of they couldn't they needed to do battle with Wigley, who had his French guy. They found their French guy who wrote a book called The Folk Architecture that turned out to be, un I mean, how can an architect not use a book called The Folk or an architectural ideology? Critical regionalism is also an ideology. These are all meant to replace the essential truths of modernism. And of course, one can't fail to mention one of the more recent exciting ideologies, crypto delusion materialism, and that's any that's any book with Sanford Pointer, where Sanford Pointer has written the introduction. So that's a new, that's an undiscovered form of ideology, I claim, and trademark that one, but you'll see why that actually uh, is true. Um, here, the utopian vanguardists are replaced by theory vanguards uh, or pomo rearguards. What's, what is the same, however, is that action is driven by thought. This is the whole criticality model. Action is driven by thought. What I'm going to say is that if, if modernism is driven by ideals, postmodernism is, post is driven by ideology, which critiques those ideals and makes arguments for little shards of truth left over called ideologies that drive practice. I'm going to say that since the end of the 90s, we've moved into a new intellectual model, what I'm going to call intelligence, where thinking doesn't guide doing, thinking is a form of doing itself. It's a form of action that produces things that I want to talk about in a second. It takes two forms that I'll talk a little bit about, these iterative forms, both scenarios and prototypes. Prototyping is a form of thinking by doing, uh, which, produce, uh, which I want to argue produces design knowledge or design intelligence. Design thinking 
replaces the ideologies of postmodernism or and or the manifestos of modernism. And the practitioners are design intelligence or going on. Now, we all know this story very well. We know th these are the ideals, and there are many more books I can put up uh, here. We know these are the ideologists, some of whom even wear red in black and white photographs. Um, <laughs> opposition. My ideology is better than your ideology. My ideology is the best. These are arguments for what is and is not true, what is and is not architecture, after the critique of the universal establishment of what that was by enlightenment or by modernism. And we know these as well. Homo, decon, folding in architecture. Now, um, what, I, what, I, what I'd like to do, if you'll just indulge me, I think we, still, we have still have plenty of time, is I'm a really, uh, I'm a really incredibly good writer. Uh, I really write beautifully. Uh, so, I'm, I'm not joking, I really do write well. <laughs> What I'd like to do is, instead of trying to re recapitulate this, is to read you a little, just, uh, just a couple of paragraphs, because I know you're going to enjoy it. It's, it's really, and you haven't, you haven't heard this before. It's perfect. Um, I'm gonna what I'm going to talk a little, what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to try to talk about is what is design thinking, and how is that different in the architect and the engineer? Because I said, business schools are doing it, engineering schools are doing it, the military is doing it, by God, we have to figure out, the only people who aren't doing it, the engineer is, is close to us, so let's see if we can figure that out. This is a, a, a piece that I did for a book on AKT, which is, a, uh, which is an engineering firm in, uh, in London who did Zaha's thing of science building and has done building for all science and science. But, um, there's something really, I, I think, very important and beautifully written in this, in this piece. Um, it's, a, it's a, just a couple of paragraphs, and it's about uh, uh, Peter Rice's book, An Engineer Imagines, which some of you may have read. It's very hard to get your hands on the book. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible book. Um, Rice begins the role of the engineer, perhaps the most enlightening chapter in the book, with the following observation. I am, engin I am an engineer. Often people will call me architect engineer as a compliment. It is meant to signify a quality of engineer who is more imaginative and design-oriented than a normal engineer. If people find an engineer making original designs which only an engineer can make, they feel the need to grant him or her a higher accolade, hence architect engineer, in the court. Um, Rice goes on to point out that the engineer's work is just as imaginative as that of the architect. The principal difference between them being that the architect works more subjectively to create, while the engineer works more objectively to invent. Rice believes that both the architect and the engineer are designers, though each has a different design process. And it's this process I want to try to uncover, uh, which is at the bottom of this idea of design thinking. Architects approach a design problem from the standpoint of their own personal design signature. They are often hired, as Rice notes, to solve a design problem precisely because the way they will respond and even the, the style of the response is known beforehand. After all, it's the solution recognized before and after the commission in the architect's signature style, which the client seeks in selecting an architect. The engineer, on the other hand, approaches design problems as if the solutions were not known in advance and therefore needs to be produced. If successful, the architect designs a, quote, new solution, that is anticipated in the problem given. While for the engineer, success depends entirely on designing an innovative and therefore unanticipated solution. Rice insists that this goes for all engineering, not just the obvious innovations, such as the many he engineered in his own illustrious career um, at ERA. Sorry, there, that's him. Um, there are, he believes, engineering innovations occurring all the time. It's just that we don't pay close attention to them. If we were to pay, uh, take careful notice, he suggests, we'd be able to better understand the originality of the engineer's inventions. Probably every solution put forward by an engineer has some unusual element, some feature that could be called innovative, but is not recognized because it is buried in an otherwise conventional solution. And if we examine the nature of these otherwise innovative 
or inventive elements, we will find that it is just the result of the engineers being intelligent or sensible about the way some detail has always been, and in so reassessing the problem from another point of view. That's the goal. Rice here reveals in this short passage the key to understanding the engineer's design process. Rather than design alternative solutions to the problem given, the engineer instead reassesses and reposes the problem from another point of view. Engineering problems, he says, are shaped by objective parameters. And so each problem has only one solution. That is why the problem must be approached with an intelligence that comes from knowing about the problem and the way it has always been, as well as knowing and understanding various solutions to an array of similar problems and the objective parameters that shaped it. Rice says that in his own case, innovative solutions all arise unexpectedly, often while working on another problem, as occurred with the structural solution for the floor of Lloyd's of London, uh, which came to him when he was working in Turin on a project for Fiat. What is more, innovations come not because engineers go looking for innovative solutions, but as a result of the engineer shaping and reshaping of the problem. This is really the part of it. Solutions are not always final solutions and are often more important in helping lead the engineer to a more clearly defined, to more clearly define the problem than they are as designs in their own right. It is the sensible approach that in fact that defines the engineer's disposition toward the problem. As each problem is shaped by objective parameters, so then are these parameters shaped by a particular point of view. And it is just these points of view that the engineer considers and re reconsiders in shaping each problem, uh, each uh, proposed solution, until finally the right problem emerges. Not the right solution, the right problem finally emerges. Invoking the title of Rice's book, we could say that the engineer imagines alternatives that reveal what the design solution might be depending on which parameters are considered imposing the problem. Breaking with the what if, or rather breaking with the what is in pursuit of the what if, the engineer uses the design to think through and solve problems. Knowing which parameters, which what if to work with, and in what ways is enhanced and expanded with every new problem the engineer poses and solves, whether it results in an innovation or not. I'm getting close, I promise. Even within the framework of a single design problem, each parametric change in subsequent question and solution increases the engineer's design knowledge or intelligence about a material, a structure, or a process. And this knowledge can become important in other or future problems when adjusting the parameters that shape those problems. <coughs> The rewards of innovation extend then beyond the immediate problem at hand and become engines for creating new design intelligence that further enhances the engineer's ability to design innovative solutions. Last bit, I promise. I'll even change the slide. By focusing on the engineer's design process, Weiss ultimately leads us to draw the surprising conclusion that design innovation, that design drives innovation rather than the other way around. Design drives innovation, innovation doesn't create or derive design. That is, if by design is meant not only the architect's creation, but also the engineer's invention. Design, as we see in examples ranging from Frank Gehr's Bow to the Apple iPod, has become an important feature of our increasingly innovation-driven economy. But it is not only the design that is important, not just the object. What is important, what is perhaps just as important, is the value added by what design leaders like David Kelly of IEO call design thinking, which is a form of design prototyping that follows a classic distinction made by business thinker Peter Drucker between problem solving, which answers without questioning the problem given, and therefore adds nothing new, and innovation, which interrogates and reforms the problem given, and adds value by creating new knowledge and new products not anticipated in the problem itself. Problem solving shapes the known while innovation coaxes into existence the unknown. Design thinking is a thinking by doing in which plausible solutions are prototyped, interrogated, and redesigned. Prototypes, which IDEO calls the shorthand of innovation, are not, however, variations of a final, of a projected final design. They are not guesses extrapolated from a designer's perfect idea about what the final design might be. They are instead what ifs that the designer uses to drive the innovation process itself. The designer uses the prototype to think through as many factors as necessary 
material cost fabrication and adjust the design accordingly. Not only are the assumptions of the problem given transformed, opening the way for new innovations, but also with each prototype, new design intelligence is created that can be shared and discussed among teams of designers whose additional input further enhances the innovation process itself. Okay, so I, the, the, I guess the, the, the bigger point here is that, is that Rice's, Rice's distinction between the architect and the, and, the, and the engineer is that the engineer is always drawing on a body of design knowledge about uh, the way in which problems are shaped and formed, not necessarily on the solutions themselves. Let me, let me go to a couple of other quick examples and try to flesh this out a little bit. Um, this is this this is the piece of, I just read to you from. Is the, is the, this is the uh, Zaha's building in Germany that this engineering firm designed system details. They did this piece by Thomas Heatherwick. But actually, they, they what they've done is they re, they formed a design unit inside their say 150 person engineering firm um, who are in, who when charged with by an architect with figuring out how to design a roof had invented little coupling devices or little small devices that become, in fact, extremely important because they patent these things and sell them and they make a lot more money than they do on any of the actual work they do with the architects. Here's a similar story. Um, some of you will know the story well because uh, you probably are one of, or the other of these people. Some of you may even know one of the other of these people. This is a common story. So, so it's now story time. I, I, I won't read any more and no more charts. As the architect, uh, you saw earlier, but Bernard Schumi always wears a red scarf. Brilliant architects from South America, particularly Argentina, typically wear black scarves, and they're very cool and yellow. This is the architect. We'll call him Marcel. And this is a, it's another character called Fabricator. You'll notice straight away that the architect thinking about the great design. What can I do? What can I do to innovate? How can I get a cover for the magazine? The fabricator is already trying to figure out how am I going to make this thing? What are we doing? And then they have a discussion about this great idea that Marcelo has this beautiful project that he has on Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles. And it really is a beautiful project. These are some of the original ideas Marcelo takes to the fabricator. He says, look, fabricator, I've got this brilliant design, but I don't know how to make this thing. You're the engineer, don't you make stuff? You make, make this one. Or rather, you're the fabricator, you make this one. And he shows the, the fabricator all these things. And the, it, it becomes very clear to the fabricator that, in fact, you can't make the thing in the way that Marcelo has designed it because the material that Marcelo would like to use, while it's very cool that it would generate the possibility for a cover for a magazine, that can't be used. So the material the research guy, Ruben, starts to run this through a lot of tests. Uh, they do prototypes of it, they think about it, they make it, it takes them a while, they go back and forth with the architect, and, they, and then they're able to do it, they start to manufacture it, they produce it. The, the point of the story is this. At the end of the day, Marcelo, the architect, is a brilliant guy and a great designer, and what he, but what he really wants is a cover of a magazine and a cool product at the end of the day. Ruben wants something different. Ruben wants to, 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 to use the testing of those materials and the making of that project as a way to generate a body of design knowledge that Ruben is going to take to the next project. So Marcelo, for Marcelo, it begins and ends with the object. For Ruben, the, having to make it is also a form of design. Marcelo doesn't consider what Ruben is doing as design. For him, that's just making the thing that I've designed. Ruben, that making is a form of design, and that making generates a whole body of design knowledge, which very soon accumulates and forms a, a, a reservoir that, 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 that Ruben can take to new projects. But also, it becomes very clear soon that, Mar that Ruben, in fact, doesn't need Marcelo, uh, because Ruben can hire some of Marcelo's students to come up with the great ideas. And in fact, Ruben starts to make his own little design office in his material research company. The moral of the story is, who do you want to be, Ruben or Marcelo? Now, Marcelo was a cooler guy, maybe, um, 
But Ruben is going to hire all of his students and replace them if we don't, if we're not careful. You know, it's part of the story. So beautiful. Okay, uh, that was supposed to be a funny story. You can laugh now. But it's not so funny because you're all architects. That's all right. Okay. Um, I gave this. I gave a talk like this last week uh, in the morning to 3M Corporation to engineers. And they laughed at that part. And I gave that same lecture that evening at the University of Minnesota at the School of Architecture, and they had the same response that you had. Not good. Um, let's talk about this design thinking in another way. Um, you all uh, know uh, this little essay probably written by uh, Brandon's niece, Anna uh, Wagner. Uh, this was a piece that she did uh, when they were collaborating on a project with Heritage and they were in the New York and Astor Place. It never got built. But it's interesting because in this little piece, which some of you may have read, she draws a distinction between the two very different ways that the two offices use models. Um, and if you know OMA, you know, and in fact, I've seen a lot of these uh, here at your school, so I'm very happy to see that. But this is what she says about the two different ways in which they use models. In Rotterdam, ideas are never just before they materialize. The intellectual level of our labor is extremely low. We generate models without censure. Rim accepts no assumptions. He only wants evidence and lots of it. Most models look clumsy and rough. We cannot spend a day building an exquisite model in the woodshop. We have to make 10 more for the next meeting. Jacques needs instant perfection. He has a vision that he doesn't take shit. Even in the very first stage of the design, concepts come with built-in details and reality checks. Models must have a tangible surface. Jacques touches and examines the models as if shopping for shirts. What do you think? Is this going to look good on me? Now, what I want to point out in this example is that OMA uses models to generate design knowledge by the first thing that it says is ideas are never judged before they materialize. Models are used as a means of materializing thought, which then can be tested and iteratively used in the design process itself. Models are means of thinking, they're means of design thinking. For Herzog, like our friend Marcelo, the model comes, springs forth like Athena from the head of Zeus. It's a, it's a, it's, it sticks, it's perfect. It's, it, it's, it's like a beautiful shirt, you try it on. It looks good on me, that's it. Um, the model is not a tool to think with. It's at the end of the process. It's the final thing. Very, very, very different way to think about models and to think about the way in which you use the models to think. It's another uh, another example of design thinking, but this is a this is this not a very good picture. I apologize to Ben for this another um, uh, um, This is this is what happens when, when design thinking and the knowledge generated by design thinking accumulates and forms forms into re these reservoirs I was talking about of design knowledge. Um, this has been, I, I, don't, I don't know if Ben talked about this when he was here, but this is, I think it's an amazing monograph. It's a real departure for, that's my phone, my college. Um, uh, uh, it's a real departure from, I think, the way at least that they talk about uh, uh, their design process in the past. Um, it's, a, it's a new monograph, it's called Design Models. Uh, uh, and uh, in the book, in his first essay in the book, and Merkel says something really, really radical. Just basically, we're no longer designing projects anymore. We only are designing and redesigning models. Um, and, the, and the first essay is, is design models. What he says is, uh, he's, he's got this, I'll, I'll run through this, digital design labs all over the world spill out an internal stream of inchoate compositions in the form of effectively uh, Pretty spaghetti, impenetrable blobs, and as a last resort, doom shapes, uh, doom like shapes are result from morphing these blobs back into spaghetti. Makes a difference in the subject of the parametric design studies in a museum, a school, a railway station, or a private residence, nor if the product is supposed to be situated on a beach in a city or in a close industrial periphery. The same textureless, wavy strands and prodigious lumps keep recurring. This is the Beaux Arts all over again. Architecture has once again become strictly academic. But how could this have happened? There's nothing intrinsically sterile to this technique. The only reason for the lack of evolution of computational design techniques is that they are taught and exercised in a hermetic way that is impossible to sustain in actual practice. It simply is not possible to foresee and register in your computer all the parameters that you will be working with as you engage uh, in the long and complex process of architecture. 
beginning with an early vision, whether that uh, whether that of the architect or of the client, and ending with a ruling progress. What one of the things that 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 he that he's let me just finish this out. I'm sorry, I can't go without saying it. Um, one of the things that that he's talking about, and, 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 and what's so I think almost heretical about this argument about models is that they say this in the book. And I don't know how many people have read it, but say we've been practicing since 1988. First as in the Berkeley Carolina Boston now as you studio, and in that time we've built a lot of projects. We've worked on a lot of projects. Um, we've had a lot of people through the office. Um, what we see, if you were to take all of that design that we did since 1988 and consider that a form of, say, chatter, it's information. So to every drawing, every sketch, every line, every model, what we did is we, we went back and we basically did a kind of a pattern recognition. We discovered in all of that work that there are essentially seven models um, that for us, oh my God, I'm sorry, I'm get to this. this is the problem with living in forever. Uh, in, in, in kind of sifting back through all of that, this, all of that sort of design production, all that design information, all that design knowledge, we discovered that yeah, there are seven models that we will use going forward in all of our projects. So, if we get a competition, we take these models and we, we use these as a kind of a primitive and we approach the project like that. Very much like, uh, say, uh, 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 Hawkins was discussing earlier with this idea of intelligence. So the mo a model is like a form of pattern that's written on the design brain. Speculate with a new project with that pattern, one of these models. And when new information is added, that model gets more robust and more complicated. So, so what, 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 what they're doing essentially is, is using this production of design knowledge. And what's, and also what's very different about it is this. What's very different, I would say, about UN Studios use of design models than all those ideologies that I listed earlier in the postmodern period is A, the knowledge is transforming and evolving and changing over time with the models. As, as each new project emerges and, just, and a model is used to develop that project, that model evolves and changes. Moreover, what's really, really significant is there is not some pre-existing truth that comes from a French philosopher, from a physicist from the early part of the 20th century, or from any other source. There is no form of knowledge that comes in from outside and drives the project and generates it. The knowledge is generated by the work itself. By recombing the work itself, they discover essentially their design DNA, which are these seven models, which is basically <coughs> the transformation of chatter into recognizable patterns, which are their models, which then they use going forward. Those are models that they generate. They don't find those outside. They're neither true nor false. They're not arguing with the enlightenment. These are models that they use to do things with. I think you can say the same thing uh, is true Versioning um, with the, with the, this model of design speculation that Pasquarelli and the other shop people talk about and develop in their book, uh, versioning. Um, so, so let's just try to, to, to go quickly and bring it to a close, and maybe we'll have questions about this. It's clear when you look at uh, at, 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 the, at the size of monographs in the last ten or fifteen years. That, that something really different has been occurring. These are not just projects that we're seeing stacked up in these big books. These are, this is something new, something different. And of course you know all these books very well. Um, what's new and what's different about them, even the small books, like this one, these are, these are essentially catalogs of design knowledge generated by these offices. These are, this is congenial forms of design knowledge, uh, not necessarily in the form of products, although products are in there, but these are, as in this last, these are all mostly techniques. Now, this is a bad example because this is a, a sadly, a version of crypto Lewis materials because I think Sanford did write the introduction to this one, but nonetheless, it could be, we <laughs> could, could be salvaged. Um, uh, see, there's Sanford's introduction to prove. Um, 
but this, the uh, Rise of Komodo's uh, Atlas of Novel Tectonics is like, I think, the Models book, like SMLXL, like the Aranda Lash book, uh, basically a collection of design techniques, design knowledge, very much like the, and this maybe is, 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 is you all know this book, but I, I, I would make an argument that this is also a congealed form of design knowledge. If you know, you know the book, you know the product pretty well. All of the, say, design moves, all the techniques, all of the work were kind of repurposed, analyzed, and used to generate this book, which shows the way these, this, this product and a number of other projects were, uh, could be used going forward. In fact, um, FOA talks very much about, their, about this book in that way. There are, just to show that this happens at the urban scale, of course, that, you know, this, this idea of, um, of, of uh, design knowledge or of intelligence or, let's say, of uh, a spreadsheet way of knowledge um, can also be found at the urban scale in something like the NVRDB's region maker. Um, and in fact, a lot of the Dutch are very interested in this form of iterative knowledge production, um, which is basically scenario-based. You know, it's a, it's a software program. They take a lot of parameters, very much like a spreadsheet way of knowledge. They speculate about what would happen in the region if these parameters were included. And the speculation that results are essentially scenarios of what might be. This is not what is, and we can argue about it. These are what might be. So this is plausible knowledge, this is intelligence, that's produced by the software that can be used by NPRDB in the development of the computer project. So the argument is that scenarios and the prototyping are, are, are creating a new form of design knowledge that's neither idealistic nor is it ideological. It is speculative and plausible and it might be true. Its, its, its importance is not that it's true or not. It's that it's a form of knowledge that could be true if these parameters were selected, and that form of knowledge then goes back and makes the choices possible a lot greater, and it makes the, the response by the by the planner more robust. And this happens, you know, it happens another firm, Max One uh, in Rotterdam, who uses also uh, these scenario techniques and developed 29 uh, proposals for the city uh, in the Harbor of Rotterdam called Old Fleet, um, using scenarios to. to Develop ultimately an urban plan at that time. And this is just a, it's, it's another scenario driven analysis of various way created 227 bridges for an extension of new track. Okay, um, I think that's all. Uh, I hope I haven't confused you. I hope it's been clear. I hope you enjoyed my beautiful text, and uh, we can, uh, I'd be happy to take questions.
they're, they're, they're two, let's just say they're, they're, I would say they're two different kind of things going on here. I, I needed a way to kind of lead into the discussion about this historical model that I want to talk about in terms of intelligence. And there is a lot, my point was, there is a lot of critique of those excesses. There's a lot of critique of star architecture and their objects. And I'm going to say there are good reasons to criticize those. A number of us have been criticizing those for a while on other grounds than the ones that are being used to criticize them now, which in my view are mostly moralistic um, and uh, compensatory. So, so I think there are better ways to criticize what's been happening. So that's one thing, and I'm happy, I would be happy to talk more about what I actually talked about. But let's just go back to your example about, about the global economy. Uh, it is the case that many of the instruments of innovation that were invented uh, by the smart guys using you know, all the smart tools uh, didn't work, but they worked for some people. They worked in many cases for the people who invented and use those models. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. Um, but in fact, a lot of those techniques and a lot of those tools and those modelings uh, worked quite well for, for the people who use those. They've made a wreck of the global economy, that's for sure. And so innovation is a dangerous thing, but it's neither, innovation, I would say, is, neither, is not a moralistic issue. It's not good or evil. It's good or bad, depending on what's good for you or what's bad for you. The people who invented those derivatives tools was quite good. For the, for, for the rest of us, it was, it was hellish. Yeah? Uh, but it's not a moral issue. So, so, the, so I would say this, this argument that that there are no philosophical truths left and appeals to ideology really don't get us anywhere anymore. And we have to rely on produced knowledge. I think that's a pretty valid argument. I don't, I don't, I, I, I'll stand by that. Um, but. But certainly, the use of these models, and the use of these devices, especially these devices of innovation, were um, uh, put us in a really ugly place today, that's for sure. So innovation is not always um, good for everybody, but it's good for some people. Yeah. I have two questions for you. One of them has to do more with uh, architecture school. That's good. So, um, as a, and I'm speaking as a student, but, um, do you think that architecture schools generally, or maybe, you know, whatever, I'm interested in what you think about them, but um, like in terms of you speaking about problem solving versus uh, questioning the problems or sort of innovation as a, as a way of challenging the problem in the first place, do you yeah. think that architecture schools are stuck in um, a mode where students are presented with a problem that they're expected to solve rather than encouraged? Well, this school is, is fantastic. We're fine. We're fine. It's not an issue here. Um, that's a different issue. But uh, let's say um, what I was alluding to was this distinction that a number of people have drawn between problem solving and innovation. Problem solving, and architects want to know why they don't get paid very much. You're my client. I'm an architect. You come to me and you say, I want a brown house with yellow windows. And I say, okay, I'll solve that problem. I'll make a brown house with yellow windows in a blue driveway. If you come to me with that, and I say to you, my experience suggests that that's probably not a good problem. Uh, let's reimagine that problem. Maybe you need wood. Maybe you don't need a driveway. Maybe it should be blue. Maybe it, I draw on this, you know, essentially on this body of knowledge that I built up. Of course, it doesn't take much knowledge to know that you don't need a blue driveway. You don't want a brown house, but still. Um, when you, when you come to me with that problem and I give you back the problem that you give me, I've added nothing. I've simply completed your problem. If you come to me with a problem and I add my expertise to that problem, and, I, and, and, and in doing so, I add value to the problem that you've given, then I'm worth more than simply solving that problem. Now, I'm not saying architects do one or the other, but, but to the extent that architects are simply problem solvers, they are not worth any more than the fees that they get. 
when they when they add something to the problem given, which most architects do in the form, you know, using the design knowledge that they have, then they then they can be said to be innovating, and that's that's the point that Drucker. Now, the, one of the problems is one of the issues I think in school is we don't we don't really encourage that kind of design thinking as part of the design curriculum. Let me give you an example. And I'll give you an example of using sort of prototyping and CNC and all that stuff. Uh, I had a discussion with students before we did a little interview. We talked about the same issue. When I went to Syrac in 1998, Neil Dunnard was a director and they were just beginning to introduce a computer into the school. And uh, there was a, if you know Syrac, you know that the school, historically, was a school known for making physical models, but all kinds of things. At 3 o'clock in the morning, there's somebody, you know, melting lead somewhere, dripping it on stuff. Some idiotic reason, but still they're making stuff all the time. It's interesting, kind of interesting. So it's a school, yeah. So when you bring computer culture with that, you've got a problem. You got people who hate each other on both sides of this. The problem begins to get more interesting when uh, when you get output technologies like CNC milling, 3D printers, laser cutters, and all that stuff, where the mod with a design that goes on with the 3D animation software can get output. And, there's, and so there's some physical stuff coming out of here. Phase one of that, however, was that the stuff that was being sort of 3D printed and output uh, and CNC milled was a final design. It was a prototype in a bad way. We just put some red car paint on it and called it 21st century. When in fact, you know, I, I recall the summer driving into this parking lot of Sire when Bill McDonald was designing a cool model that was going to be in a show that Frederick Nibiru did, uh, t using 21st century software, making 21st century shapes. And they had tables lined up in the parking lot with all of my students sandpapering them in a very 14th century kind of way. So, so, uh, so, so yeah, so, so, but initially, <coughs> this, is, this is the use that was made of these output technologies. What's beginning to happen, I think, in a lot of schools now, is those 3D printers, those CNC machines, those vacuum formers, are now producing designs that come off the computer that are output that are much more akin to this idea of design thinking, where the model is produced. It's a way of it's a way of design thinking. So the prototype comes out. The prototype is a way of, of, of driving innovation. It's not the innovation. So in that first phase. The prototype that's painted with red car paint is the innovation. It's beginning to be more the case now that these tools are used more as ways of speculating about certain design moves. They come out, you sit around a table, you discuss those, you redesign, and it goes back in. This is how thinking becomes a form of doing, doing becomes a form of thinking, and it's an iterative process of design, not one where a great idea drives the production of the endpoint model, which is the prototype that's painted red, nor some critical apparatus is applied to the problem, and you find some theoretical justification for the project. So, so I think it has real implications for the way we use in curriculum and we use these tools and techniques. Um, but, but, but it's not just a digital issue. The, the, the example I pointed out uh, of OMA, the way that they use uh, the models, uh, just the phone core models, is, is, is similar. Right? Ren wants the ideas materialized so that we can use those as means of design thinking. That materialization is a form of design, it's a form of thinking through the project itself, and it will result in a more robust proposal. Great idea, it comes with details, there's only one, that's it, it's beautiful, we painted red, put it on, sure. Um, so, so the implications for this, I think, are are, are enormous. I think they're, they're they're huge, especially given that so much now is being driven by 3D animation software and output technologies like we have. Um, but you can see it in a clear example like that in a place like Cyber. Yes. I'd like to ask you this Thank you. Uh, we, I don't know if you could advance back to the slide, which is your first um, word graph. The chart. Yeah, you want more of the chart? Yeah, I want more of the chart. It's the first time I've ever been asked that. Yeah. I have to say. Uh, but I can go back quickly here. But well, yeah, what's your question? The question is, 
in your last column, yeah. under Super Bowl, and the provides security versus provides opportunity, do you think that this discussion about the provision of opportunity is more just an artifact of our time now? Because I think that you could probably build a similar argument for the provision of opportunity, in, for example, um, in the period of um, industrialization that's in place with modern school of thought. And I guess another one of the reasons why I ask the question is because in your other graph, your other, your other chart, you link um, this sort of idea of innovation to, to thinking and doing. And I think probably you can find instances of thinking and doing across many of these I wouldn't disagree with that. Let me just say that that, uh, that the argument that I'm making with the chart is a is a historical um, tool itself. It's a kind of prototyping of, of a possible truth about how we make sense of where we are, and that the argument is that this these are the intellectual dominance of this period. It's not that some of these other things aren't going on. The argument about the market state is based on uh, a, a, a couple of books uh, uh, you know, written in the last couple of years about this the emergence of, let's say it like this, many people believe in the, say in the 60s and 90s that the state as an apparatus would disappear. Michael Hart and Tony Magri in their, in their book Empire suggest something like that. What is proposed by the idea of the market state, and I don't want to go into the whole, thing. I can give you the references later, is that States haven't disappeared, they operate more like companies now. They no longer provide for their people, they don't give social security, they, don't, they basically provide opportunity for innovation. If you innovate, you produce good, if you don't, too bad for you. And in fact, you know, we see a lot of it, there, there are some early examples of this even in architecture. The Dutch state uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 90s operated very much like a market state. It operated like a big company that promoted design all over the world, and I mean, I was a kind of a, I was a, a basically a kind of a salesperson for that stuff, so I, I know that situation quite well. It's a key, I mean, that is a key thing, because quite often innovation must be driven by a part that the government's very good at establishing markets. Yeah. Are there any, anything else? Oh. I'm yeah. next. But, but they, they have, there was a question right here. Oh, that's not Let's take the lie of the bullshitter and the intelligencer. 
The liar knows or believes they know a truth, which that would be a modernist. But the problem is there really wasn't one because here's the problem. These people were right that these, that these people were wrong. It's just that they want to go backwards to a more originary truth. And I want to say that there's actually there is a more useful form of truth than these originary forms or the enlightenment truth. And those originary and that those new forms of truth are the truths discovered or produced rather produced by the intelligence. What don't you buy? It's about the source of the agenda. Yeah. I'll approve. Well, okay. So we're going, to, we're going to get to just we'll cut to the chase quickly with the question because I'm, I'll use a distinction made by uh, by uh, almost all of the people in the middle by a famous thinker that, that, that all of them draw Gilles Deleuze. He draw he draws a distinction between morals and ethics, and I just refer to it. I think ideologists need morality. They need good and evil. And ethics simply is about what's good and what's bad for you. And in my view, ethics belongs over there, and morality is here. And so, I don't like moral people. Oh, but Michael, that's such a bullshit because you are the ultimate morals. The design of intelligence has to be an ideology. You can't present it. I'm not presenting it as opposed to the whole context. I think the entire bulk of your argument is what is not. Come on. It's an ideology, very simple. And the claims are more or less couldn't be more moralistic. The tone of the argument, the sky is sides, the economy. We miss you, Bob. Ask the same, ask it, ask it all the time. Sure. Here 
Um, otherwise, you just want to make an ad hominem attack on me, which is okay, but then that would make you even more of a moralist than I am. Um, but uh, uh, you, back to your question: What? How, how do we? How do we make decisions? I don't think any of these decisions are made in the end. Try it. Just take you in studio as an example. If in fact what they've done is to say we have had a practice for it since 1988 and we've produced all these projects, what we want to do now is to essentially do a kind of a pattern recognition project. Look at all, of, look at all those projects, find that there are these seven or eight models that we've used and we can take those going, going forward. The way in which they use those models, the way in which they use those, say, to develop a project for a competition or for an commission. How that is successful or not is going to depend on them and that project and how that accords with the model. And so I don't think it's something that one can answer um, in advance. In other words, how you choose, how 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 intelligence is used, is to, you know depends on I think the practice. It depends on the office itself. It's, it's a very situational uh, way of deciding. Ultimately, what counts for innovations, what you know, is decided by by what we choose to, to purchase or what we choose to believe in or not. If you believe in all of this, if you believe what I just said, then this is an innovative lecture and, uh, and a compelling argument and it's ethical um, and you might go and use some of this. So if you consume it, if you believe it, then it's, then it's, it's a successful innovation. It's basically it's a marketplace. It's successful and wins the competition or doesn't win the competition. I, I don't, I don't really, really fully understand the question. I think part of it just, I mean, kind of distinction of cotton. I mean, I agree with sort of Ellen and, and Bob Rust, which is that your your argument, categorical argument, is a meta argument, and so in a sense, uh, it's motivated by saying we're in this third paradigm. But after that, at a certain point, you're agnostic. And as someone who's interested in design and teaching studio, I can't be agnostic between Hernan and Vidimas. Mm. I have to make a choice. And that's the question, where do you get motivated at a sub-level? As, as a meta-thinker, Michael doesn't care. Uh, you know, but as a, you know, someone else, you have to decide. But that's a, that's a false choice. Between Vidimas and Hernan, it's not. Uh, between Vinny no, 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 I mean. For you, it's a false choice. For me, it's a very important choice. No, 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 I mean, I mean, a more accurate way to, to put it would be to choose between, say, Shop and Vinny Moss. I would say Shop is engaged in the production of design. Now, I don't think, uh, Hernan is here, but in his own world in here, right? Hernan. Back to A plus U R. Well, some things you do are bullshit and some things you do are not. Um, I, I would say, for, for sure, Hernan still fits into that car paint kind of model to a great degree. So Hernan is, I don't think Hernan thinks of what he does as being a lawyer. I don't, I don't, I don't think of, yeah. But you're right to say that, uh, that, 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 and this goes back to Bob's question too. Uh, you're right to say that um, I'm offering a kind of historical argument and then I'm agnostic in, and, and, and that I'm also, I'm really not pushing this thing down here. I'm not, I'm not arguing that these, I'm simply saying this is the way it is. Well, the question is, is what doesn't fall within the argument, which is, I think, what was 
said earlier. I, I'd like to and what is that? Well, I'm asking you. I mean, I'm back to I'm not telling you. Well, when, I ask, when I ask a question about blind spots, I'm thinking about, for example, like just simply the limits of architectural representation. Like what we do or don't see. How that kind of limit could kind of weaken our ability to perform within this kind of space. Our, just to say that again, the, the limits of representation. What we do, in a, well, the, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole idea of, say, intelligence is there are enormous things. Well, I'll use a run spell example. Uh, as bad as an awful a person as he is, he was right. There are things we know. There are things that we don't know. There are things that we don't know that we don't know. Now, if you, if you, now let's just say those things that we don't know that we don't know are part of, they're part of the reservoir of all the stuff that's in this chatter. That's, that can only be a surface through this, this model of prototyping and speculation. It's not just one spell, this is also Spinoza. Spinoza's the same way. Right? There are people who don't know the difference. There, there, there's, there's normal knowledge, there's scientific knowledge, and there's knowledge from the point of view of God. You know? uh, normal knowledge, the only difference between normal knowledge and scientific knowledge is that people scientific knowledge know that they don't know everything. The people who have common sense knowledge think that they know everything, but they know nothing. Scientists know that they know nothing, but they know that. If you can approximate knowledge from the point of God, you would be in the intelligence model. <laughs> <laughs> Parts of it that you that you think don't accord the parts the parts of the model that you think don't accord with reality point them out to me and we can have a discussion about that. I'll leave it like that. Yeah. I, I don't want to test the model. I don't either. Um, I, I think it's great.